So it is my, uh, my honor to, um, to introduce Salim Ishmael. Um, Salim is a much sought after uh, speaker, strategist, and entrepreneur based in Silicon Valley. Uh, for the past six years, he has been driving Singularity University's growth uh, as its founding executive director, and now he is the global ambassador um, with a mandate to expand its global footprint. Um, Salim appears in multiple media outlets. He is an advisor to Fortune 500 executives and governments around the world on the future of technology. And he recently accomplished a huge thing, which is publishing his first book, Exponential Organizations. It's my pleasure to introduce Salim Ishmael. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you for all the support from uh, Deloitte and all the other partners. And, and really thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is really a really important event. We started this uh, four or five years ago. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what Singularity is about to give you a sense of it. Just a quick question so I can get a show of it. How many of you heard me speak yesterday? Okay, they seem to be all over here, and these folks over here, okay, I'm gonna just figure it out. You folks just check your emails and so on while I speak. <laughs> we'll figure out, uh, you've seen me. Uh, this is a little bit about my background. I've been spending six years doing, uh, setting up and building out Singularity University. I was the head of innovation at Yahoo before that. Uh, I spent 10 years in Europe uh, restructuring large organizations there, uh, mostly French ones, which is why I'm bald, and if you've interacted with French companies, you'll understand that. Um, and we've, uh, it's really fascinating. I, I, I went to Waterloo, I'm a Canadian uh, citizen, alumni from uh, Waterloo. I was with the, with the president of, of Waterloo this morning, uh, and uh, they're tr we're trying to set up a relationship with them and with Communitech, and we're gonna have some interesting dis discussions going forward. I was the worst student ever while I was there, so it's good that uh, I've got good relationships with them going forward. Uh, how many of you have seen this image before? I wanna just see a show of hands. Have you ever seen this image? Okay, if you look closely in the middle of that image, there's the image of a dog. Uh, its head is to the ground, it's facing away. Um, uh, does everybody, did anybody see the image? Let me make it easy for you. There's the, there's the dog, right? Um, now that you see that, you actually can't not see it, right? Your, your, your brain is now geared towards spotting that image. Um, and what we try and do with our programs, both our longer programs and our shorter programs, and frankly tonight, I want you to th never think about the technology in the same way again after you uh, go through a singularity type of an event or an experience or an education. Um, we want to tilt the way people relate to technology. We believe you will, you will find that we are technology optimists. Um, uh, we think that technology is a major tool for progress, maybe the only major driver of progress that we've ever had. And we're particularly excited today because we are uniquely today, we have several technologies that are moving very, very fast. Right? Um, so when you next see this image, you'll curse us because you can't not see the dog, you're stuck looking at it. Uh, by the way, from a neuroscience perspective, we have absolutely no idea how this act happens. We don't know how the brain creates a permanent one-way learning that can't be reversed. Right? It's one of the little mysteries that we're dealing with. Um, so uh, we are based at NASA in, in Silicon Valley. We're six, six and a half years old. We got initial funding from Google, Cisco, Nokia, Autodesk to get started. Um, this is our, a photograph from our founding conference. And I, I don't know if anybody has a laser pointer that I can use. That would be kind of interesting. Does anybody have one? Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you look in the middle there, there's, with the glasses, there's Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamandis on the right in the beige jacket. I'm kind of behind Ray. That's Larry Page behind me. Uh, on the right is Chris Anderson from Wired Magazine in the light blue. Uh, uh, George Smoot is in the front here. He's a Nobel Prize winner in dark matter. And we brought together 70 kind of thought leaders around Silicon Valley and we asked the question, is it worth creating an educational institution only focused on accelerating technologies? And there were a couple of interesting observations that came from this particular day. Uh, Larry Page got up and said, look, when I th meet people, I ask the question, are you doing something that will really change the world? And 99.99% of the people say no. And what we're looking for, and if you're interested in doing this, we want to fund and, and sponsor and find those people that are interested in changing the world. So that was one kind of steering and direction we got. The second was a really interesting observation that if you look at some of the biggest problems that we have in the world today, the spread of a pandemic or aspects of climate change or the financial crisis that we're still struggling under, they're rooted in accelerating factors and exponential factors. 
Right? The spread of a pandemic is exponential. I give Ebola to two people. I don't have Ebola, but just don't go through. I give it to two people, you give it to four people, they give it to eight people, and it goes kind of geometric and exponential from there. The, the financial crisis driven by the acceleration in the underlying derivatives and other instruments. And our leadership around the world, business, but especially political, uh, can't cope with this. Uh, if you look at how Ebola spread over the first few months, we had no real response to it. Right? And you can't address an exponential problem with a linear solution. You actually need a completely different way of thinking about the problem space. And so that's essentially where our founding and our thought processes stem from. Uh, Ray Kurzweil put this graph together where he showed that anything that's information-based starts doubling in its price performance uh, very, very steadily. And that's actually in logarithmic y-axis, so the endpoint on that chart, which is essentially Moore's law, which has shown the doubling in price performance of computation now over 110 years, the end point on that chart is actually 18 million times higher than the starting point. And we've seen this incredible explosion in computational speeds. Uh, Peter wrote this book, Abundance, uh, which is worth reading if you've not read it. He, uh, uh, Bill Clinton just named it as one of the two most important books that he's ever read. And he lays out in this book that if you actually project forward and harness the capabilities in some of these fast-moving technologies, we get, could actually have an abundance of clean water, energy, healthcare, education in about a decade. And what would the world look like if that was the case? And how powerful would we be able to be? Um, we've, brought, we've now seen this doubling pattern, this kind of steady doubling every year or two in all of these technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, neuroscience, uh, synthetic biology, all of these have aspects of their domains that are moving at this accelerated pace. And we've just never seen that before. This is the first time in the history of mankind that we have so many technologies moving so quickly. One way I often frame this is in the 1500s, we had the Gutenberg moment, and the printing press changed everything. And today, it's like we're having 20 or 30 Gutenberg moments at the same time. And it's an extraordinary time to be alive. We've assembled, in each of these domains, the world's leading experts and thought leaders, researchers, scientists, uh, to come and talk and teach about these technologies. Uh, uh, Vince Cerf at the top left created the IP address system and helped invent the internet. Uh, Craig Venter at the bottom right sequenced the first human genome and actually created the first artificial uh, life form three, four years ago, and so on. Um, this is our classroom environment uh, in Silicon Valley, fairly kind of low key. Um, and the heart of our program is really what these contestants are going after. Uh, in the heart of our program, every summer we have a graduate studies program. We have 80 students that come from 40 different countries, uh, and they live with us at NASA for 10 weeks. Okay? Uh, for about, we, we now get about 5,000 applicants from 120 countries fighting over 80 slots. It's one of those, if I applied, I'd never get in. It's one of those kinds of uh, places. Um, and what we look for is, is academic, academically strong backgrounds in some of our students because we're throwing a fire hose of information at them. We look for leadership, existing leadership qualities. They've built a company, they've run an NGO, they've been involved in politics, and they're passionate and interested in solving big problems. And that kind of combination gives us our sweet spot of who we want to have attend. What we're really looking for is who is going to be running these countries in the next 10 or 20 years. And if we can give, bring them and give them an awareness of how to leverage technology and harness it effectively, how to think about the ethics and dangers of it, and send them back to their home countries, we will have accomplished something of our mission statement. Um, uh, this is what our 10-week program looks like. They come in at the beginning for about half the summer. We deliver 300 hours of lectures, labs, and workshops on the future of all of these technologies. We spend about 80% of our curriculum teaching the future as opposed to the past. So we complement traditional academics, which thinks mostly about, you know, how did this equation evolve? How did this model uh, come about? Uh, we think mostly about where is this going? Uh, if you're thinking about, say, biology, what will happen when we get to the $100 genome? What applications become enabled? Where are these fields intersecting? Who are the thought leaders in each of these areas? What companies and labs are doing cutting edge work? So that when we hit those inflection points in these different technologies, people have some sense of what to do about it, what to look for, what opportunities might exist, and so on. In the second half of the summer, we turn into an incubator. And we challenge the students to pick a global problem space, clean water, healthcare, energy, education, et cetera. And the challenge we give them is come up with an idea that would positively impact a billion people within 10 years. Okay? You have three weeks, off you go. Uh, and we're in Silicon Valley after all. Um, your tie, where is, uh, where is Jeremy? 
your tie would not be allowed in our, in our classroom, just, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and so we look to do this, to harness this type of thinking and really think at scale, right? Uh, one of the um, issues I've noticed in most parts of the world, when people are doing entrepreneurship, they're trying to improve the status quo by a little bit. And we want them to really break out. And something interesting happens when you spend a summer thinking about how you would impact a billion people, you can't go back to a small problem after that. You're kind of stuck. You're stuck thinking at a global level, and we like that, right? And so we hope when we send them back, they're thinking at this pace of change. Um, at the end of the summer, we launched these projects as NGOs, for-profit companies, research ideas, and so on. We've done about 60 such startups, about 10 a year on average. We've kind of launched in this way. Here's an example from three months ago. This team actually is about four years old. This team came to our 2010 uh, program. Um, they've actually launched a 3D printer and sent it up to the space station. Okay? Uh, because a lot of the extra weight that we, we take up there is extra spare parts, multiple redundancy spare parts. If a valve goes bad, you'd better have a replacement. And so the, all of the extra, all of the closet space and cupboard space and drawer space in the space station is totally, ironically, there's no space in the space station. It's jam-packed full of spare parts. Now, if you can print something in situ and create it as you need it, very, very interesting. And about three weeks ago, we had an inflection point where they fabricated the first ever objects, man-made objects, not made on the surface of the Earth. Right, so there's a fun inflection point to think about. Um, we do a whole series of shorter programs. That Our 10-week program is 70 days long. We do one-week executive programs. Uh, this is like a seven-minute condensed version of that in that sense. So this is the shorter program we do. This is if you're, if you're running a company today and you're not aware of what technologies may come along orthogonally and impact you, you're simply not doing your job. Right? And this is one of their dangers of it. Uh, we also project out in all of our courses, after the end of our, the education, we actually have the participants lay out what breakthroughs do they expect to see in different time frames throughout the, throughout the next couple of decades so they're practiced and well-versed in where this might go. This is one of the more interesting programs we do with, in partnership with Deloitte. We bring together CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. You can see some of the logos there. And we give them four days of in-depth briefings Two days of technology briefings, two days of organizational ideas of how to think about this and how do you organize for this. We asked them beforehand, how aware are you of some of these breakthroughs and some of these technologies? And you can imagine most uh, were, had very little awareness and half of the rest were probably exaggerating quite a bit. Um, at the end of the four days, we asked them, how big of an impact will this have on your industries? So they, we gave them a graph of two, four, six, eight, ten years and low, medium, high, game-changing impact. And the statistic there at the top absolutely floored us. 80% of them agreed that these technologies would have a game-changing impact on their industries within two years, right? 100% within five years. And all of them had urgent action items when they got back to the office. Uh, I, sp I spoke a couple of weeks ago to Isidore Sharp, the founder of Four Seasons, and he's pretty panicked about Airbnb. Right, about where will this go, how does that impact his business. Nobody five years ago would have dreamt that you'd have a major threat in the hotel industry in such a short time. Right? Airbnb is on a pace where by the end of this year they will be the biggest hotel chain in the world. Okay? And so he's gonna now, I was able to say, look, I don't think you're threatened because you're, you're attacking business travelers and if you're in a business travel environment, you're really buying a consistency and predictability. You're not really buying accommodation. Okay. But the leisure travel market, huge pot potential. So essentially what we're trying to do with Singularities is a cr create a crucible where we bring together the leading thinkers in the world in the fastest moving technologies and point people at the biggest opportunities and the biggest problem spaces. We hope something interesting happens as you swirl that uh, around. Uh, Larry Page came and, and gave this nice quote, typically in a t-shirt at our closing ceremonies, uh, said, if I was a student, this is where I'd want to be. Um, maybe the most interesting attribute of our model is because we're moving and dealing with such fast-moving technologies, we actually update our curriculum in real time. Uh, we're constantly updating what we teach because we've had all these technologies are moving so fast. Uh, in biotech, for example, we've seen four major breakthroughs just in the last year. So we've had to develop a very unique curriculum <laughs> development methodology to keep pace with this pace of change. I'm going to give you one sense of how fast this is moving. This rate of change is absolutely astounding. It's hard to imagine how fast this is going. Um, if you have a smartphone, you have more computational power in that smartphone than the entire US government had in the 1980s. Right? That's why it runs a bit hot. 
There's a lot of computational power in there. Uh, and incredible what you can do with that. And as we turn the world into information, we're doing very fascinating things with this. I'll show you one inflection point. This is robotics. This is called Baxter. How many of you have heard of Baxter? Okay. So Baxter is a, a manufacturing robot. You literally move its arms to show it what to do, and then, then does the task from then on. It does not require programming like traditional industrial robotics. It costs $22,000. Uh, it does not take coffee breaks, does not unionize, does not get sick, most, mostly. Um, my joke is this fellow is smiling, but it's about to take his job, basically, right? <laughs> he has to be a little bit careful as to how we deal with it. To give you a sense of how fast this is moving, the really kind of really uh, expensive part of Baxter is the $10,000 robotic arm that moves in like 17 degrees of freedom as a ton of servo motors and so on around it. This is a similar arm built by Saul Griffith, who's a MacArthur genius, one of our faculty at Singularity. He's building, he can do 95% of the functionality of that $10,000 arm using, using pneumatics and compressed air, except this costs $35. Right? Every time we see a step change in innovation driven by these new technologies, we see orders of magnitude lopped off the price. And this is consistent across neuroscience, synthetic biology, et cetera, et cetera. And so in neuro, in uh, biotech, the cost of sequencing DNA is dropping at five times the pace of Moore's law. It's doubling in its price performance today every four months. Okay? It costs $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. 13 years ago. Second one was about $400 million. Third one was about $50 million. We're down to today $1,000. So what cost $3 billion 13 years ago is now down to $1,000. It'll be $100 by the end of next year and so on. And I don't have time to go into all of this, but suffice it to say that explosive rate of change is now happening across. And as they intersect these technologies, uh, these technologies intersect, that adds another multiplier on top of it. So when you take 3D printing and you add biotech to it, uh, people are taking kind of cheap 3D printers, and with a the scaffolding, they're spraying layers of cells one on top of each other, and you can, then you goose it with stem cells, and you can essentially print a kidney or a liver. We're about two years away from working prototypes of kidneys and livers. We can today do heart valves, tracheas, jaw bones, nose bridges. If you have braces, those are all 3D printed already today, right? And think of the implications of just that one development that I can 3D print a liver, right? What if somebody hacks it? If I'm Irish, can I amp up the alcohol processing power of my liver, right? <laughs> All interesting questions will be asked and answered around some of these technologies. It will completely change, it'll get rid of the entire organ transplant uh, industry, right? Uh, no need anymore for organ rejection because it's your stem cells. Very, very fascinating to see how fast this is moving. Give you some, let me lift up a level and give you two examples of how this is hitting at an industry level. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize? Okay. So uh, Peter has a $10 million prize for literally the Star Trek Tricorder, a handheld diagnostic device, and you will win $10 million when your handheld device can beat the diagnosis of 10 board-certified doctors. That's essentially the prize. Um, 300 teams have been competing for this for the last few years. We're down to the final 10, kind of like today. Um, we expect the winner to be announced by the end of the year or maybe January, February next year. Okay, so by January, February next year, we will have a handheld device that will beat the diagnostic of, uh, uh, assessment of 10 board certified doctors. That will be a game changer in the healthcare space. That's half of the healthcare equation, right? Treatment is the, is the other half. I joke that hypochondriacs will have a field day with that type of a gadget. They'll be checking themselves all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a leading contender called Scanadu. Uh, that's an entire doctor's examination room in a pillbox, right? And so very dramatic changes. It led Vinod Kosla, one of the famous investors in Silicon Valley, to say, make this quote. He said, 80% of what doctors do today will be replaced by technology within a decade. Right? So if you have kids, doctors, probably not a good idea for you folks. <laughs> Go stick with the ideas you're working on. Um, I predict with all of the facial recognition and muscle twitches and features and infrared cameras that we have that in about five years, it's going to be impossible to lie. Okay, so marketing departments need to be a little bit careful. <laughs> Politicians need to be really careful as to what they're able to say. Okay, yeah. And maybe the most dramatic and actually very, very impactful for Canada is this chart. This is a graph of the price performance of solar cells it turns out the solar cells are doubling in their price performance uh, every 22 to 30 months today and have been for quite a while. 
Okay? At this pace, we will hit 100% of world energy supply deliverable by solar in 25 years. Uh, and because it's on a doubling pattern, it means that in 27 years we'll hit 200%, in 29 years we'll hit 400%, and that doubling just keeps going. Okay? It actually turns out, and, and this is a good framing for where we're going with this, it turns out that if you add up all of the energy and all of the fossil fuels we have in the entire world, all of the coal, all of the oil, all of the natural gas, all of the Athabasca oil sands, et cetera, et cetera, and add up the total amount of energy, that adds up to five days of sunlight hitting the world. And so that shifts the conversation from a scarcity problem to a conversion problem, right? And the conversion is riding that doubling pattern. And this is going to have extraordinary impact. Uh, Canada, for example, in Alberta, they're sitting pretty going, Athabasca oil sands, we're world wealthy for the next 30, 40 years. We think it'll never be used. It's fracking in the short term, again, driven by technology, solar energy in the medium and long term. And so they need to wake up a little bit and say, what are we going to do? We actually did an effort with... Uh, Deloitte last year, we brought together 100 of the most influential Canadians we could find and spent a day kind of waking them up to this, going, you're the 100 most influential people we think you should know about this. But they're Canadian, they didn't do anything. <laughs> it's a problem, right? That's part of the issue. Okay. Here's the relative cost of solar compared to some other fuels, and you can see the extraordinary price change compared to other fuels. Next year, energy will be cheaper than the, what's coming off the U.S. grid. And so that will be a huge inflection point and will hit uh, very dramatic changes in that. Uh, again, I don't have time for this, but there's one level which is the technological disruption, but we're actually facing a huge amount of social disruption because the technologies are all very sexy, but fundamentally we're not set up to absorb this pace of change. All of the mechanisms that we used to run the world, our politics and our civics and our intellectual property systems and religions and healthcare, or education, you name it, are all designed for a world a few hundred years ago. Right? Not for the world of today. Definitely not for what com what's coming down the pike. We're actually going to need to re-architect all of our social structures. And one of our concerns is all of our existing leadership structures are about managing predictability and managing the status quo, not managing for the disruption that's coming down the pike. And what we see is a huge kind of Luddite reaction as a result of some of these. Uh, Rick Scott, the, f the governor of Florida, um, as a, in faced with uh, Florida, for example, is average three feet over sea level, okay, the state of Florida. Uh, we predict a four to six foot sea level rise in the next four or five decades. And the governor of the state of Florida has banned the state EPA from using the words global warming, sea level rising, or sustainability. Okay? That's how bad it's getting in different parts of the world. They've got their head, forget head in the sand, I call that criminal negligence in terms of how you're thinking about it. And so this is the issue. This is the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy in the US Constitution. We've been warning for six years that technology is delivering us to this point. And now we're there. A fundamental pillar of American society has disappeared with no public conversation about it. Right? And so this is going to be a very structural issue in some of these countries. I mentioned our curriculum planning meetings. Even though we have the leading scientists, thought leaders, researchers in the world coming to teach, we can't become an official accredited state-sanctioned university because to do that, you have to fix your curriculum and not change it. And so that causes, again, a structural issue. And higher education is actually worse. If you're doing today a master's degree in one of these areas that we're teaching, advanced robotics or neuroscience or biotech, by the time you finish your degree, you're out of date. And so we need to architect completely new mechanisms. And it's the same with our regulatory structures. I mentioned our curriculum planning with it, but in medicine, for example, we are now determining the dosage of a drug by your DNA profile. And that changes because your DNA sequencing may be more susceptible or may absorb a certain drug better than somebody else's. So if, you, if you're doing testing now, clinical trials and testing, how do you do clinical trials when your sample size is one? And again, that's a structural issue. We need to architect completely new ways of doing it. Right? And this is the hope and the expectation and the need that we have for you kids over there. You guys are going to have to figure this out. So no pressure. Uh, we'll figure this out. Uh, let me use this example. This is a, an eight-year-old. This is a synthetic biology DNA synthesis lab in Silicon Valley. The girl in the middle there is eight years old, and she's leading the class. Turns out she knows how to pull the pipette at the right angle. She knows how to run the Dremel fuges. She's teaching the adults what to do. And part of the reason that we exist is how do you get across to that eight-year-old girl the moral and ethical 
framework to navigate these technologies. When I was that age, I was playing with chemistry sets, and the worst I could do was like blow up the garage. Right? She can change life. And so that's one of the reasons we exist. And so this is a fundamental shift in how we've been seeing the world. We're seeing an inflection point. We have never seen anything like what we're about to see in the new world. From a business perspective, we are not good at planning for this. Uh, all, of the, all of the predictions we make are always linear. Okay? This is a graph of the exponential growth in mobile phones. And we've seen doubling every two years in the growth of mobile phones. And Vinod Koslo is able to show that the experts, the mobile phone experts, at every given doubling pattern, when you have 100% growth, they expected 16%. When there was the next 100% growth, they predicted 14%. The experts in any field will always predict linearly. So when you have an ex we were fond of saying the expert in a particular field is somebody who can tell you how not to do something. And so beware the experts in a particular field. And we are not good at fundamentally at understanding this exponential growth curve. Um, all of our predictions are linear and we think linearly. So it's very hard to gauge that pace of change. We have found, by the way, uh, certain tribes in the Amazon that think exponentially. If you ask the ha them the halfway point between one and nine, they'll say three. Kind of interesting. Because all of our sensors are actually pretty exponential, decibel scale is actually an exponential scale, but we're taught linearly. So we have to undo the education and let the people think in the natural way that we're aware of. And I'll use this example to highlight how dramatically this exponential growth of computation and information is affecting even really old industries. It turns out that if you own a car wash in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, over the last six, eight years, you've seen a 60% drop in revenues. And one of our alumni from there looked at this and said, this makes absolutely no sense. The middle class has exploded. There's a ton of BMWs and Lexuses out on the streets. Argentinians are really proud. They like to keep their cars clean. If anything, you should see a doubling or a tripling in car wash revenues, not a 60% drop. This doesn't make any sense. So he looked into it. And after looking into it for quite a while, he, he, he asked the question, are there more car washes? Are there water restrictions, et cetera? And he was able to kind of cancel out all the possibilities. And then he finally found it, the answer. The answer was that because of an increased change and an increased ability of doing computation, our ability to predict the weather and run weather models was that much better. And there was a clear correlation that over a six, eight year period, we could 60% better predict when it was gonna rain. When you know it's gonna rain, you don't wash your car. Okay. Now, if you're the poor car wash owner, you are never seeing that coming. You think you're a bad business owner, you think the, there's more competition. They've had a body blow to a very, very traditional industry purely from the orthogonal impact of computation. And this is what we're seeing now across the board in many, many industries. They're gonna see this crazy pace of change. Uh, one more example is Uber. The taxi industry in San Francisco is 140 million a year. That's the annual revenues of the taxi industry. Uber is on a pace to make half a billion dollars in San Francisco this year. So not only have they taken out 80% of the existing taxi market, they've tripled the market by, by finding people who wouldn't normally take taxis but are happy to take Ubers, mostly teenagers uh, going out on rides. So we're seeing a very fundamental change from a business perspective. And as you saw from the earlier slide, our businesses are not set up to deal with this pace of change. Um, this quote from David Rose, one of our faculty, really struck home. Uh, we have to organize our businesses and our institutional architectures and our governmental architectures in a completely new way to deal with this new pace of change. And I spent the last three years, as I mentioned, writing the book, it almost killed me, uh, trying to document this. Um, the real driver behind this pace of change is the, uh, the fact that the cost is dropping so fast, it means that anybody and everybody has access to these technologies. This is a fantastic experiment that they ran in Ethiopia. They dropped 100 tablets into a village where nobody spoke English, there were no instructions with the tablets, and they said, let's see what the kids do. Okay? It took them about three minutes to turn on the tablet. By the end of a week, they were using 57 apps per tablet average, and in three weeks, they'd hacked it. The, the Bluetooth, the cameras had been turned off, they hacked into it to turn on the cameras. Right? And it shows you when you can deliver technology to the edge, People will do interesting things with it. In, after the tsunami in Indonesia a few years ago, all the radio control towers had been knocked out and there was no way of communicating from, from ship to shore. 
and the fishermen had a really tough time uh, out there navigating. So the government gave them all cell phones to at least communicate back and forth, emergency notifications, et cetera. And they found that in a month, their, their uh, incomes had increased by 30%. Because they, all they were doing was texting in and saying, has the market price changed? Should I go in to sell the fish or should I stay out fishing? And just that increase. So what we found is clear and repeated evidence that when you can deliver technology to the edge and to the most underprivileged people in the world, interesting and dramatic things happen, which is one of the reasons we've actually seen an 80% drop in extreme poverty around the world in the last three decades. We're actually in a really, really great place. Many of you know Eric Mijakovsky, who created the Pebble Watch. Um, he decided to create a runner's watch. Uh, he's a Waterloo grad, kind of fellow Canadian. Uh, he went to 20 investors in Silicon Valley saying, I want $100,000 of equity funding for, my, for this watch. Uh, the 20 investors all said no, because at the time, Silicon Valley is heavily biased towards software rather than hardware. As a desperate ploy, he puts it up on Kickstarter because he's running out of money and he needs to raise $100,000. So he says, let's see what happens. In three weeks, he has $3 million. At the end of the 10 weeks, he's got $10 million in the bank. He said his mother was freaking out, going, what, you, what the hell have you done? Why is there $10 million? How, who have you stolen this from, right? Um, now, this is incredible. This tells you two or three things. First, that all the investors were wrong. That's one uh, thing, because this is, investors use a mitigated portfolio to mitigate risk. Secondly, if you can do this, why do you need the investor? Okay? And the really rich, dense investment ecosystem in Silicon Valley has fundamentally been disrupted. The most interesting thing is that for the first time in the history of business, you can get market validation without building a product. And that's kind of cool to be able to do. We've never been able to do that before. There's an inflection point. So we know certain companies that are just throwing up Kickstarter campaigns and when something bites, they go build it. No need for market research, no need for focus groups, no need for guessing, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these technologies are going through this curve. The domain becomes digitized or information enabled. The costs go to zero. Uh, open source communities form, uh, technologies converge. You see a whole suite of new products and services and then the existing businesses get disrupted. Bitcoin is kind of at the inflection point of, the, of that technologies converging in very short order. We'll see a whole slew of new products and services based on this. And here's how dramatically you, this is democratized. This team of biohackers, this goes back again to how to control this. I showed you to some of you folks yesterday. These guys have figured out how to inject night vision into your eyeballs. So they, you get this injection, close your eyes if you're a bit squeamish, uh, and you essentially inject a little chemical into your eyeball. This is what this fellow looks like after the injection. I'm not sure I really want to try that out, but this guy now has night vision, right? Now, think of how much the military spends on night vision goggles, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? In interesting if you can do this, right? Uh, again, it's not something I would recommend you try at home. <laughs> Uh, be careful about how you do this. Okay, I want to leave you with uh, this kind of last example, one of our favorite examples of how dramatically you can make an impact if you think differently. One of the biggest problems we have in the world today is malaria. 200,000 new malaria cases a day are happening around the world. It's one of the biggest killers in the world today. And the way we detect it is you take a blood sample and you give it to a lab, somebody looks at it through a microscope and literally hits a counter to count up how many malaria parasites you can spot in some blood. Uh, enter Miguel Oroz, one of our alumni. He ends up working for the World Health Organization after he graduates from Singularity, and he says, surely there's a better way of doing this. Now, of course, if it's in developing countries, most don't get detected and they go vastly underreported. So we have an explosion of malaria all over the world, uh, one of the biggest killers in the world today. And he says, surely there's a better way. And the folks at the UN go, well, you need more experts, more lab equipment, more microscopes, et cetera, et cetera. There's no other way. It's an intractable problem. Right? And he goes, no, there's got to be a better way. And what does he do? He goes and creates a, a website called Malaria Spot. Org, and you can go try this out. And what you do is you're presented with a blood sample in a first-person shooter game, a little legend to tell you what's a parasite and what's not a parasite. And so you literally shoot parasites in a, a blood sample. Uh, in one month, they had 7,000 people identify a quarter billion malaria parasites around the world. Total cost? Zero. So what seemed to be an intractable problem, it turned out also that if 13 people played the same blood sample, they got to 100% accuracy. So now you don't even need the experts, okay? 
And so this is the kind of inflection point that we hope to instill in our students and future leaders so they think in a completely different way. And what he's done is taken a, what seems to be a completely intractable problem and taught, dropped the cost to zero and solved it. Now, to the UN's credit, they've made him head of their malaria labs worldwide. And he's now doing this for tuberculosis and other things, right? Incredible what this kid will be able to do. This is Kidis Zalecki, one of our other alumni. Um, uh, she's a, doing her PhD at the University of Houston in pure mathematics. She was growing up in Ethiopia. Uh, and at the age of, she, we had her over for dinner one night. And my wife asked her, you know, what, what age did you decide to, how does somebody from Ethiopia decide to, who's grown up in the villages, decide to go into mathematics? And she said, when I was five, the government's lying to you and your family is acting funny, et cetera, et cetera. Physics and sciences were a reality sits. That's why I, so I wanted to study that. We're like, wow, at the age of five, that's what you wanted to do. And he said, what did you do? She said, well, I couldn't go to school because school doesn't start till age seven. And she said, oh, so you waited. She goes, no, I went. We said, well, how did you get into school if you if you were age five and they don't let you in until age seven. And this five-year-old girl wanted to go to school so badly to study science and mathematics, she took a rock and she knocked out some of her teeth so she looked older, okay? That's who we want running the world in the future, right? <laughs> Thank God we accepted her. Like, what would she have done if we just said no to her, her acceptance? God, <laughs> hell knows. And I come back to Canada and the reason that we're here in this particular contest, because Canada is a really inf important inflection point in the world. Um, it's really critical that this country start getting more leadership globally around how we think about the world. The U.S. is in a political disaster and it's a mess. It's not, nothing's going to happen in the U.S. for the next decade or two. Um, Canada thinks more practically around the world. Healthcare, uh, social thinking, a little more uh, uh, sane, I will say. Uh, I've been gone through the American healthcare system. It's like a Mack truck has hit me from the side. And the, but there's one issue. We don't think effectively outside and we don't think at scale. And so that's one of the things we hope to inspire with this contest and with our presence here. And if we can inspire anybody here to think in a different way, these kids already have it, right? You can tell. So we want to teach everybody in Canada to be like this. That's essentially our hope. Right? Um, okay? And we have them. We have these examples. This is Bob Richards, one of our founding uh, uh, board members, uh, he's creating a company called Moon Express. He's creating a FedEx service for the moon, right? How crazy do you have to be to do that? He's pretty crazy, okay? And so essentially, uh, this, because this pace of change is not slowing down, this pace of change is actually accelerating. And so we need a completely new way of thinking about it. From a business perspective, if you went back into 2010, we had a billion people online around the world. It's double today, we have about two and a half billion people online. By the end of this decade, we're gonna have five billion people online. The biggest market in the history of the humanity is being created under our noses in this next few years. And if you think in that way or think in an interesting way, you can tap into that marketplace, okay? Uh, and we're gonna have kind of unique and ubiquitous internet access given by things like the Google Loon and so on. So let me pause there. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you all for participating. I want to give really a, really a big round of applause for the finalists because no matter what happens, they're in the field taking a shot at it. And the way you succeed in the world is you take a shot at it. Uh, and I'll end with one little story. One of our faculty is Dan Berry. He's a three-time space shuttle astronaut. And Dan was a space fanatic. He wanted to go into space. When he was five years old, his parents hadn't made him wear a football helmet not because he played football, because he kept jumping off the tops of things trying to fly. And after about the 15th hospital visit, they said, we're making you wear a football helmet. Right? So he was jumping off the roofs, he was jumping off the tops of stairs, he just wouldn't stop. At the age of 23, they announced the space shuttle program. And he said, I'm in. He sent in the thick application, three inches thick, to apply to be an astronaut. And he got back the thin envelope that said, "Now nah, you're not in. Okay? At the age of 24, he applies again. He gets told again, no. 25, no. 26, no. 27, no. Now he's in associate. The way you become an astronaut is either become an engineer or become a doctor. So he gets an engineering degree, then he gets a medical degree. Okay? Now he's an associate professor at the age of 30, he still gets told no. At the age of 31, he applies, he doesn't get an answer. He calls NASA and goes, listen, did you get my application? And they go, we know who you are. <laughs> so it's a, like it's hard. 32, he applies, doesn't get in. 33, 34, still doesn't get in. Now people are saying, you're too old. You're never going to get in. Astronauts are, you can't apply. 
35, 36, 37. At the age of 37, 14 years after applying, he finally gets in. Then he goes on three space shuttle flights, four spacewalks. He has the world record for the most hours in space, in free space. And this is what it takes. Uh, if you look at Larry and Sergey, who built out Google, how many of you know how many times they did an investor pitch before they told yes? 350. They did 350 investor presentations where they were told no before somebody said yes. Now, what if they'd stopped at 340? How many other entrepreneurs stopped two presentations too early? So if you have a passion, and you all do, don't ever stop. And don't ever let anybody tell you no. Just keep going. It'll happen. Okay? Thank you very much, and we look forward to the outcome.